This is episode 180 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Next Generation Scientists. Hey everyone, this is Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field, in this case, really emergent bright minds, the young ones. And if listening to this podcast isn't enough, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast, where we do our best to update you on all the latest news in the stem cell research field as it's happening. As I mentioned, today we have a special episode featuring the life force of scientific discovery, research trainees. We'll be talking to three PhD students from around the world about what they're working on and advice for future grad students. We've also got a shorter roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news coming up. But first, looking to stay current with the latest research and news in the fields of immunology and cell biology, we'd like to remind our listeners, trainees included, to check out Stem Cell Science News, featuring the most recent top peer-reviewed research and review papers, as well as industry policy and science news. Stem Cell Science News provides a platform that allows researchers to stay up to date with their field while saving time. So subscribe for free at StemCellScienceNews.com, a really helpful resource for all you trainees out there. So, you know, in these crazy times, that's how every statement pretty much begins. We're starting the roundup with that. Talking about COVID, um, you know, we're a bit fatigued, obviously, on the COVID, but it's still very front of mind for everybody, especially now as we're lurching into another surge, it seems, as uh, the cold weather approaches. This is a bombshell story from right across the street from me here while Cornell came out of the, the lab. It was led by uh, Xu Bing Cheng uh, and also corresponding author uh, Robert Schwartz on there, other authors, Todd Evans, a, a whole bunch uh, of authors on there, but led by Shubin. Um, also, I want to highlight here the bioinformatics people at the core. I love these guys. Dong Zhu, love you. Zing Wang, Jenny Zhang, Tuo Zhang. These are my guys, all right? We don't give enough run to all the bioinformatics people who are grinding out there to give us all these single cell plots. So I just took a minute there for you, Dong. I hope you're listening. Um, getting back to the story, this is a story about drug screening. You know, we've, we've thought a lot about the vaccine. Everyone was racing out the vaccine and trying to see what the pathology of the disease is. We've gone through all the paces, including the antibodies. Um, and now we're talking about drugs, you know, kind of, kind of back to the future in terms of the old traditional pharmacological paradigm, how we can treat COVID with something robust in a pill. Um, and that led us to this drug screening thing, which Shubin has really been killing it with uh, these high throughput screens. In this case, of course, you know, a couple of years ago, she did Zika to that end. We talked about that in the show. And here she turned her, her attention to COVID, uh, her and her colleagues. Um, and the idea is, you know, typically these drug screens are performed on cell lines. But of course, that fails to capture all the physiologically relevant dynamics, especially in this case of COVID infection. Um, and there's a lot of organoid models up to this point now. Uh, that have been developed to study SARS. So they applied a uh, uh, human IPS organoid model, in fact, two of them, which were these lung as well as colonic organoids. And I just want to get into the details since we're just doing one story, and this is a really nice, uh, 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 a kind of a quick thrust uh, that got into Nature Journal, you know, highest caliber journal out there, um, just because it was so important, but it was very elegant, straightforward, also using the highest tech. First, they uh, generated these lung organoids, which have been shown by other groups, but then they implanted them into NSG mice so that they get the in vivo readout and, and specifically showed that they developed these distal lung structures with the AT2-like cells, okay? And those are really important because those are the cells that express ACE2. Um, and 24 hours after they inoculated that xenograft with SARS-CoV-2, they saw by this luciferase reporter for the virus that it was there, it was banging. All right. Um, and also looking at the transcription response, robust induction of chemokine transcripts, uh, which is consistent with that whole inflammatory response you see with COVID. And also specifically with the gene set enrichment analysis, there was a lot of pathways that uh, enrich that look just like lung on autopsy tissue from COVID-19 uh, patients. So, 
you know, in vitro, in the xenograft, the disease affected cells look just like what we see in these autopsies. So that was a good sign. Then also going on to these colonic uh, organoids where they showed that there was ACE2 expression specifically in these KR220 positive enterocytes. Okay. And also similar uh, methods there, they did the xenograft, show that this enterocyte population decreased in response to COVID because they were killed, a lot of corresponding with a apoptosis. Um, uh, and, you know, transplanted them on the kidney capsule of NSG mouse, similar to the lung organoids showed that they were capable of uh, being infected. And then they went to the drug screening here, where they first in vitro looked at what would affect this luciferase reporter to see what could uh, inhibit the ability of the viral entry and infectiousness and, and found that there were four drugs that were conformed, uh, confirmed to block luciferase activity in a dose-responsive manner. Um, those were imatinib, okay, and then mycophenolic acid, quinacrine, dihydrochloride, and chloroquine. You hear that? Chloroquine. Not hydroxychloroquine, but like chloroquine, all right? It's close. Um, yeah, it's close. It's, you know, it has similar activity. They didn't look into that one. They didn't follow up on that one, maybe because it's always been, already been <laughs> thrown in the pooper by um, some more uh, rigorous analysis and clinical trials. But they looked at the other three and they found that they could uh, block infection um, and, you know, a bunch of assay that I'm not going to get into. But uh, I think the, the real uh, key innovation here is that we moved on to this next stage, which is the drugs. And interestingly, I mean, and I said it before, the matinib, um, I didn't know this, but uh, in the discussion, Shubin and colleagues, they, they, uh, they talk about how there's already five clinical trials that have been registered to apply a matinib to, to treat COVID-19 patients. I don't know exactly where all those trials came to the idea of a because it was a bit surprising to me, but hey, uh, they kind of got scooped. Uh, it's already out there, but I, I think this is nevertheless a really strong story. And you always talk about it, Arun, um, a great example of how we can use these screens to repurpose uh, drugs that are already approved by the FDA to address this emergent situation. You know, clearly we don't have the time to be running new drugs uh, through the whole trial process. It's not like vaccines. It's much more rigorous in the terms of pharma um, or antibodies. So, you know, this is a good application of this drug repurposing by Shubin and colleagues. Congratulations again, Dr. Chen. You are on fire. Congratulations to your colleagues from right down the road there. I'm going to talk about the imatinib side of things in, in a second here, but I uh, definitely want to give props to the Chen lab. You know, they actually had this major paper in cell stem cell, I think we covered uh, a few months ago, um, using all sorts of organoids and all sorts of iPS-derived cells to look at the tissue cell type susceptibility of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I think that was like one of the first really high profile papers that used iPS derivative and pluripotent stem cell derivatives to model coronavirus infection. So they're just really on a roll here. And this is sort of a follow-up to that. But coming back to the the imatinib point, right? I, I get it. It's imatinib has been around for a long time, as you mentioned. This is you know looking at drug repurposing, and uh, you know imatinib has gone through the FDA trials and the FDA rigors, you know, a long time ago. It's it's a staple drug, Gleevec. You know, it's it's in use in pretty much every hospital, right? But <laughs> the thing that you know, and this is nothing against the Chen lab, you know, this, this is what they found in their screen. The thing with a lot of these small molecules, imatinib in particular, is they have a lot of off-target effects, right? And I think that's what we're seeing here. They're showing that imatinib, which is normally a BCR-able kinase inhibitor used to treat chronic myeloid leukemia, C CML, right? They're showing that it's a competitive inhibitor of ACE2, which is kind of the definition of an off-target effect for me, right? <laughs> but hey, like they're not they're not the only ones who've shown this. As you mentioned, there's like five clinical trials showing uh, working on imatinib as an antiviral, and uh, if it works, it works, right? But to me, me mechanistically, it it doesn't make the most sense, and it's like it's almost like you're taking advantage of one of these known off-target effects of this drug. 
Yes. Uh, but that's good old fashioned medicine as far as I'm concerned. Who cares how it works as long as it works? Um, but I, I think your point is well taken. And uh, uh, it's, a, you know, it's it's one of those firsts, you know, the the first paper that addressed, you know, the pathology that got high profile, maybe there are a few bits and pieces missing there. You know, the first antibodies, same thing. Here, we're in a vacuum where there's really no drug besides the ones that people are kind of just, you know, in inferring uh, efficacy from. We've had uh, these drugs that have been circulating in the news media, um, you know, anecdotally, and then maybe it doesn't work out so much in trial. So it's nice, I think, to see someone come from an unbiased ground, you know, I wouldn't say ground truth, because as you're talking about, it's kind of off target, but at least this is unbiased. Okay. It's at least yeah. it's, it's, it's looking, um, with, with, without, you know, already having the, uh, the prejudice of the existing drugs and, and <laughs> lo and behold, they circled back and came to drug that that was already in trial. So it's kind of the, the snake eating its tail there, but the approach I think is laudable. And I, 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 my question would be how big was this library and yeah. how sensitive? And if we could only catch four candidates from this library, if it was expansive, then what does that mean? Like, is that a dead end or do we just have to get more high sensitivity or more expensive libraries to see if there are other drug candidates? Or is the idea of using drugs to treat COVID maybe not the best approach? I don't know. We'll have to see the follow-ups to the story. Yeah, a lot of questions, but uh, this is obviously a, a big need right now. Anytime we can accelerate the development of some of these drugs to, to combat COVID-19, I think it's a good thing, right? And, you know, all these drugs have gone through the rigors of FDA trials and, you know, <laughs> we don't have time to spare, right? right. So that, that's part of it. That's part of it. Um, but so props to the Chen Lab for this really nice screen and it's, you know, hit upon a, a familiar candidate in Imatinib and Gleba. So more to come from that, I'm sure. So staying in a similar realm of lung work, not directly COVID-19 related work, but you know, it's got COVID-19 applications. The paper I'm going to talk about next is coming from the lab of Daryl Cotton up there in Boston Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, first author is Finn Hawkins and the title of the paper, cell stem cell paper, is derivation of airway basal cells airway basal stem cells from human pluripotent stem cells. Okay. So these folks have shown that they can create these airway basal stem cells in vitro from iPSCs by, uh, you know, through your standard iPSC derivation. And they showed that these basal cells can be defined as actual stem cells of the airways because they can regenerate the airway epithelium in response to injury. And as I mentioned, this has a bunch of applications for all sorts of diseases and, you know, things that have to do with the lung and the airway, including, of course, COVID-19, the flu, asthma, cystic fibrosis, and, and so on. And this is a collaborative effort, as I mentioned, between folks at BU and also uh, others at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Also, actually, a couple folks from here at Cedar sinai too. So they are... Uh, outlining how to actually generate and purify large quantities of these airway basal stem cells using patient samples. And this allows for the development of hopefully individual disease-specific airway basal stem cells that you can use for disease modeling or transplantation. And this is actually something they actually um, uh, focused on a little bit in the study. They looked at some uh, xenograft and transplantation models in, in rodent systems as well. One big reason that I, I love this paper and I love papers from the Cotton Lab is that, and I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit later, but I, I love their lab's philosophy, their open source biology philosophy, where they can, if you go to their lab website, all of their data, all of their omics data is really just straight up in your face. A lot of times you have to kind of dig around and really hunt, you know, for, for, for a while to actually find data coming from these uh, major studies. Well, the Cotton Lab has really organized their lab website nicely to show uh, the data sets from all of their recent high profile papers, including a number of papers from uh, related to COVID-19. But back to this study. 
So they used a dual fluorescent reporter system, this NKX 2-1 GFP TP63 T tomato, to actually track and purify these basal cells as they're first emerging as developmentally immature NKX 2-1 GFP lung progenitors. And then next, they actually augmented the TP63 program during the epithelial patterning uh, and the differentiation. And so in response to this primary basal cell medium, uh, these NKX2-1 TP63 cells actually had the molecular uh, phenotypes of real airway basal cells, okay, including the capacity to self-renew because they are somewhat adult stem cells, right, or to undergo multi-lineage differentiation in vitro and also importantly in vivo, so in a tracheal xenograft system. OK. Uh, and, you know, the the applications are numerous. Right. For example, what if you can use these cells as a replacement cell source for cystic fibrosis? All right. You could do disease modeling for cystic fibrosis as well. Correct the genetic mutation and understand how these basal cells are. You know, uh, the phenotype is alleviated. So I'm a, you know, as I mentioned, a big fan of the Cotton Lab, big fan of these fluorescent reporter systems that are really important and really powerful for tracking stem cell derivatives. All of their data is right up in your face in their lab website. Uh, they've also got a really nice COVID-19 subsection, and they've been really uh, upfront about sharing their resources, especially resources related to anything COVID-19, whether it's vectors, whether it's cell lines, whether it's data sets. So I think the Cotton Lab is is a lab, you know, that, you know, we can really, we can strive to emulate. This is open science at its best. I love this story. It's like, uh, I love the con lab like you, because it's like, uh, you know, you, you hear about, the, they wrote the book on, you know, he, he, they're writing the book on uh, lung airway uh, differentiation from pluripotent stem cells. And, and the work is so comprehensive. This is a great example, I think, because, you know, a lot of groups, I think, can demonstrate the feasibility. I think uh, Cotton Lab, they take it a step further by really laying it out in a practical way. Here, they start with the reporters, but then they have a whole section where they're like, look, realistically, we're not going to be using reporters uh, mm -hmm. for therapy. So we need to find surface markers that are identify these same cells. Boom, they go, they get the equivalency, something that's clinically practical. They say, okay, what's the next thing? We got to show that these work in vivo. They do the decellularized trachea and these rats and show that they engraft in vivo. So, you know, they, they take it right up uh, to, the, to, the, to the limit, right? In a way that's so complete that what's left to do is very clear uh, and, and laid out. And in this case, you know, there's a few steps necessary, you know, that, that you talk about recolonizing the airway in the case of genetic disease. You know, that's not exactly what they did here. It was in the trachea. But the, the principle is there. There's a whole idea of like maturity, whether these cells represent a, 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 an adult correlate, a mature correlate. And what's interesting, I thought, is that the, the basal cells look really much like the adult, but their mm -hmm. derivatives uh, that they make look fetal. So there's a little bit of disconnect there in terms of the, the scope of the, the maturation of these of these cells. But like I said, it, it's taking it up to the limit, totally transparent, saying this is what it is. These are the limits of these cells. This is everything you need to get to this point, to the limit, and then take it beyond. So uh, a very impressive piece of work uh, from, from uh, Dr. Cotton and his co colleagues. Yeah, great piece of work. It's, uh, um, you know, the Cotton Lab is, like you said, real pioneers in IPS differentiation of everything lung related. And as you mentioned, there are some limitations in the study. And the nice thing uh, that Cell Press has done recently, I think I've mentioned this before, they've straight up and, you know, tell the authors, OK, we want to have a limitations section at the very end of this paper. Shout out to you, Sheila Chari. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, limitations, as you mentioned, first and foremost, that immaturity aspect that you mentioned, there's some differences when it comes to the gene expression. Uh, but, hey, it's uh, it's a great it's a great resource and a great model for uh, for everything uh, lung basal cell related. Yes. You could learn a lot about the lung. Cotton, a great educator, has a lot of great trainees, though. And we're going to get to those trainees on this show to see what fills out these great stories. You know, we always talk about the lead author, but, um, you know, the first author is really the one who drives the story. Uh, but before we get to that, I have a message from Stem Cell Technologies who'd like 
to introduce their one-step resource for researchers who are using or looking to use organoids in their experiments. We talked about some organoids today, didn't we? We do every day. Mm -hmm. Stem Cells Organoid Information Hub provides scientists with instructional videos, educational webinars, expert interviews, technical tips, and curated publications to help researchers set up and optimize organoids as a research model in their labs. Learn about organoid culture from the experts at Stem Cell. Visit www.stemcell.com slash discover dash organoids. Get over there and look at that. All right, our first interview is with Navid Tavakal, a biomedical engineering PhD student in the Laboratory for Stem Cells and Tissue Engineering at Columbia University under the advisement of Dr. Gordana Bunyak Novakovic. As a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow, he's working on translational approaches to integrated organ-on-a-chip systems with a specific focus on the hematopoietic system. All right, Navid, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you both for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, so we're in love with cool new technologies on this show, Navid, as you obviously know, right? Especially those that are expanding kind of what's possible in stem cell biology. And part of the reason we wanted to have you on the show is you're actually working on one of these next-gen technologies and organ chips as part of your thesis. And you're actually using them for disease modeling and for drug toxicity too. So we don't talk too much about organ chips on the show, you know, focusing more on organoids and whatnot. So why don't you give us an overview and our listeners an insight into why organ chips are so exciting and what you're hoping to do with this technology? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think uh, one of the things that first intrigued me about the field is that like tissue engineering as a whole, so this this field of being able to use cells and their materials and different biochemical cues to influence uh, tissue function or regeneration uh, actually had like a little shift in direction um, in focusing on modeling different diseases and different organs. So I think about 10 years ago, uh, one of the first few papers that came out was really looking at how you could use either primary or uh, at that point it was primary cells um, to engineer a tissue that could recapitulate some type of uh, organ function. Um, so for the most part, the field, uh, from my perspective, is really looking to mimic different organs in vitro uh, to be able to see the effects of certain drugs on an organ, um, but also look at diseases and how they progress and study the biology of different diseases. Um, I mean, I'm most excited right now about the kind of combination of other technologies as well, into, like organs on a chip and uh, these microphysiological systems um like with the advent of ips uh stem cells as you guys are obviously aware of in this podcast um a lot of different groups are really working on using patient specific models of each of these organs um to study a disease that might only happen in like one patient versus another um and i think that's where like most of the field is really going i think we're really going to a, a place where people can take one specific patient, uh, make them like make their IPS cells from that and then differentiate them into different uh, cell types that can then become organ chips. Yeah, you mentioned it. Uh, it was like a decade ago, right, where we first started being able to manipulate these primary cell types and show that they could recapitulate function. Um, and, you know, I know you're, you're a bioengineer by training, but it's always a fine line between the engineer and the bio part of that. Uh, I don't know where you lie there, but I, I know that a lot of engineers, they meet the bio part and they realize how much more complicated biology is uh, versus, you know, the flow charts and the systems that seem relatively uh, easy to understand relative to the complexity of biology. Anyway, I know that that you're into bioengineering and stem cells now because they're so integrated. You know, you mentioned those primary cells and the organoids, those first organs that are coming up. Um, and now it's like they're seamlessly integrated. You have the stem cell biology and engineering are like hand in hand. But when I was coming up, the whole 3D idea seemed really far off. You know, this is like 20 years ago. I'm an old man at this point. Um, but now here we are. We're surrounded by organoids. Lo and behold, I want to know for you, because, you know, you're earlier on in the training phase and there's probably some things that seem really far off for you. What's your kind of bioengineering unicorn 
the, the far out goal that the young bioengineers in stem cell biology are, you know, it's a bit ambitious as a goal, but they're still aspiring toward it. What's the, that big deal um, that's going to make the next huge splash? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I think the thing that's most exciting to me um, and something that kind of ties into the work that we're doing uh, in my lab is really being able to combine what the technologies have been uh, like up and coming in the past few years. So uh, this is from modeling one organ to multiple organs in a single in, in a single dish and being able to recapitulate basically like a patient in a dish where you have multiple different organs interacting with it, with each other, causing each organ to behave differently um, or in, in tune with each other. And I think there we can actually better predict some of the um, some of the biology that we're really interested in. So if you're looking at disease modeling, are you able to actually see how one one patient might be able to react differently um, than another patient, why that's happening? And can we look for cures of diseases with models like this instead of um, instead of studying them in animal models or, or whatnot. And I think to me, like tissue engineering as a field kind of broke down into the regeneration and then also the modeling aspect. Mm -hmm. And so I think right now I see like a large potential of these, um, these models really informing drug testing and then also studying biology of how diseases are progressing. But I also think the two fields can kind of mix in the future. And I think in the, in the next maybe 10 years or so, we'll see more and more groups using organ on chip models to test different regenerative treatments. Mm. Um, so if you're, if you're able to basically uh, take different therapeutics that people are developing, um, mix that with the organ on the chip models or whatever in vitro model you have, you can better see how that would re basically relate back to that patient in the mm. future. Mm. Um, because we don't really understand exactly how, well, some regenerative treatments are more transplantation of, of engineered organs. So that's, that's one facet of it. But other regenerative therapeutics, like just in our own lab, we have um, a group developing extracellular vesicles for cardiac repair. Mm -hmm. And so are you able to test some of these therapeutics in in vitro systems um, like organs on a chip or the engineered heart tissues? That's a question I think people will get more and more towards in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you talked about your lab just now. You know, if you're a member of Dr. Gordana Funyak Novakovich's lab at Columbia, just the, down the road from Dalon, right? And, you know, Gordana is a yeah. bioengineering icon, to say the least. A few months ago, we actually had one of your lab superstars, Casey Ronaldson Bouchard. I think she's actually one of your mentors as well. Uh, she was on the show and we talked about cardiac tissue engineering. You actually just alluded to it. So it seems like your lab is just one of those special places that seems to breed trainee success and bioengineering trainee success, whether it's high profile papers, startups, et cetera. So as a trainee in Gordana's lab, tell us what's in the, the secret sauce of the lab. What's mm -hmm. it about the Bunyak Novakovic lab that makes it such a great place for trainees? I talk about our lab a lot in, uh, in talking to prospective students and stuff like that. And I think it's really um, a mix of, I mean, I love my advisor. I think Gordana is one of the uh, best people I could have ever trained under in, in my life. I mean, I think she's very unique in that she um, is so busy. She's always doing a variety of different projects. Our lab is very diverse. We focus on many different areas, um, but she still spends the time and gets to know all of her students, gets to know all the projects, helps develop all the projects, but also is really adamant about letting students really pick their own project and pick their own area. So if they're interested in this, she'll, she'll help them connect them to the right people, um, help advise how this project can go in one direction versus another. And we have so many different research areas because she really lets everyone do what they want um, and then work with the people that uh, make sense. So we have collaborations with people all over Colombia, um, places around the country, around the world. And I think she's so open to letting students really take advantage of their own education um, which I find super uh, encouraging as a as a trainee myself, and then having other mentors in the lab generally caring about one another, and I think that's a really really good thing to have in a lab. Um, I think the lab is like thirty or so people. We like constantly have more and more people, whether it's trainees or postdocs, and I think everyone really is welcoming, and there's a really close knit uh, community there, and. Um, 
I think that's, I, I don't think it's unique about every lab, but I think it's something that I really, really appreciate about our lab and the trainee style that Gordana has uh, employed for us. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think overall, there's just so many things that I think have been, uh, I've learned as a, as a trainee in the lab. And I think all of these things are really uh, reliant on the fact that Gordana really cares for her trainees to get the experiences that they want to get. Yeah, it's a great lab uh, <clears throat> in a great city. I remember mentioning you right down the road from me. And we were here, you know, in the epicenter of the COVID crisis, at yeah. least clinically. Um, but it's the same everywhere. I mean, everybody's dealing with it. Yeah. And uh, I think in the science sphere, it, it goes two ways. You know, there's like the established scientists where it seems like groups, you know, also I think postdocs in their later years, Arun, uh, you, you did uh, something similar where you take like, you know, you know what you're doing, you're set on your path, uh, but you pivot, right? Because COVID, it's a crisis. Also, there's funding there. But I wonder how it is for uh, trainees uh, such as yourself. Like you're in a position where you could really completely pivot your research, research direction, um, although you may not want to. It's feasible. Uh, has being in the midst of this and still being kind of labile uh, in your career, has it influenced the way you see your, your track uh, progressing forward? I mean, any, any adjustments that you would make to your path? Um, I don't, for right now, I don't really think, I think being here at the, like the start of COVID in the U S was very, um, interesting. I don't think I've ever really seen, like, I, I personally was very afraid of going outside, you know, for that early period of time and then, uh, went home for a few weeks and then came back. And I think it was nice being able to kind of separate what was important in the academic world and what was important in like my personal life. Um, and I think now, like looking back, I don't think my research direction really has changed, but it's allowed me to really, um, get a chance to explore other things in, in academia, the other things in, in scientific research that you wouldn't normally get, get the sense, um, of in, in when there isn't like a virtual community. So we had like over the past few months, we've been developing seminars, um, that our lab has been hosting with Gordana. Um, the tissue talk. So this is where we have different tissue engineering speakers. And I think it's really allowed for people from really around the world to be able to get the sense of what tissue engineering is and what, what people are doing in the field without having to go to a conference. Um, I think stuff like that is really, for me, like exciting and allows me to really, uh, allows all of us really to be able to see speakers who you wouldn't normally be able to see because of, you know, they're at one conference, but not another um, and then also being able to kind of build that tissue engineering community, um, a little bit like of a closer, uh, community that I think, um, I personally have really enjoyed being a part of these virtual seminars and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. The, uh, silver lining of this has been the proliferation of these virtual, uh, landscapes for science communication and exchange. And, I feel like it was inevitable, but it's kind of like the demise of, you know, coal. You know, you can have these events that, that really accelerate it. And it's your generation, the young trainees that I think are leading the charge, Arun, on Twitter, uh, to, you know, bring that new virtual uh, science sphere about. But of course, we still have the, the real life science, IRL. I learned that on Twitter, the <laughs> IRL science as well. So uh, we're in both spheres and, and you're leading the charge. Naveed, thank you so much for talking to us for this little uh, mini interview. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I look forward to hearing from the rest of the speakers. <laughs> All right, our next guest is Natasha Mudiwa Muanigua a PhD researcher in the Developmental and Cellular Biology Group at the Luxembourg Center of Systems Biomedicine. She uses midbrain-specific organoids to model and study the molecular and cellular changes that occur in the midbrain during the progression of Parkinson's disease. All right, Natasha, thanks a lot for joining us for this chat. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Well, we're very excited to have you on. Um, Let's start with uh, your work. You're investigating mechanisms of neuroplasticity and aging in a human midbrain organoid model of Parkinson's disease. Wow. 
Um, <laughs> now, Parkinson's has some hallmark features like the Lewy bodies and an alpha synuclein accumulation and death of dopaminergic neurons and astrocytes. Are you able to replicate some of these hallmark features in your organoids? I mean, that's the thing about organoids that they say, right? It's like the whole meta thing. And we've been working all these years in monolayer, monotypic cultures, and the organoid is like, it's the system. So are we able to, to recapitulate these kind of sy systemic elements of the disease in your organoids? Tell us about it. Yeah, so I think that's actually what makes the organoids pretty cool and uh, why it's so exciting to work with them because they actually do recapitulate some of these key hallmarks that, you know, before you couldn't really model um, some of these fundamental things in Parkinson's in, in, two, in 2D cultures. So, for example, um, in our group, so um, there have already been a couple of papers that we publish where we actually show that we have uh, death of the dopaminergic neurons or the loss of dopaminergic neurons after you keep the organoids in culture for a long time, which is pretty cool that you actually see that. And also even the accumulation of um, protein aggregates of these Lewy bodies, um, primarily with alpha synuclein. this is something that um, I've been looking at a lot because for my project specifically, I'm working with organoids derived from patients with uh, the alpha synuclein triplication mutation. Um, and so we can actually see this um, aggregation and this accumulation of, of alpha synuclein in these in these organoids. Um, and so now it's trying to pick apart exactly what's happening um, during the progression of the disease using these these models. So we want to see before we actually have aggregation, what's happening on the molecular and cellular uh, cellular level. But it's 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 it's, it's I, I still find it pretty bizarre that we can actually model this in the organoids. It's, 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 it's quite, it's quite crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you might think it's bizarre, but I think it's pretty amazing that you're able to see some of these incredible phenotypes of, you know, alpha synuclein accumulation, some of these hallmark features of Parkinson's disease in this sort of artificial model. It's a three dimensional model. It's getting better, but it's still somewhat of an artificial model. Right. And Hey, that's a big reason why we're fans of organoids on the show. It seems like we talk about them every single episode, but talking a little bit more about you and your roots, you're actually originally from Zimbabwe and you've done a lot of your scientific training in Europe, which is where you're at right now. And of course, there's a ton of amazing scientific talent coming from Africa, yourself included. But unfortunately, African scientists don't always get highlighted and credited in the mess in the Western media as much. But to help boost the perception of African scientists, you actually started a website and an effort titled Visibility STEM Africa to actually show that African representation and visibility is important and it matters in science. So tell us more about this amazing and really important project of yours. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, um, so I started Visibility STEM Africa because of my own journey. Um, as you said, I've spent the majority of my training. I've been in Europe since my undergrad uh, up till now, my PhD. And uh, it was a bit of a lonely journey in the sense that I was often the only African in the room, often the only black person in the room. Um, so I kind of faced a lot of imposter syndrome, particularly in my master's. Um, and then this kind of made me, when I started my PhD, I was like, you know, um, I started seeing a lot of different efforts, like women in STEM efforts, black in STEM efforts, um, you know, to to Im improve the the um, like diversity and inclusion in the STEM space. But there didn't seem to be anything Africa specific. Um, so I just kind of had this idea, like, what if I created a platform that would actually do this? Um, because representation obviously matters. You know, it's hard to be what you can't see. Um, so I wanted to create that somewhat selfishly for myself because I wanted to find hmm. other Africans, you know, who are doing amazing things, but also for other young people. Because uh, for me, I kind of fell into research. I didn't aspire to it when I was younger. It didn't seem like an option for me. Um, so I wanted to kind of change that narrative for younger people and to see like people working with organoids, you know, that the black Zimbabwean woman can work with organoids and it's there. So, so I co-created it with somebody who I met on Twitter, actually, which is crazy and we have not met in real life, um, which is it's wild, but we, we we worked on it together. Her name is also Natasha, coincidentally. Um, and coincidentally, we also lived in Botswana for 10 years. We're basically the same person, just like <laughs> <laughs> she's in Australia, I'm in Luxembourg. So we co-created this together um, and just, yeah, created this website. We spotlight African scientists from both those on the continent and in the diaspora who are doing all sorts of things from PIs to people in industry, science communicators, just to highlight their amazing work. And 
yeah, to put it out there within mainstream media so people actually see Africans. Uh, just generally, I think a lot of people just don't know anything about <laughs> Africa. A lot of people are like, oh yeah, Africa, like it's it's like a really big continent, you know. So we just want to show also the diversity of stories and um, inspire people and help change the narrative as we go forward. So yeah, that was that that's that's what we're doing with that, and it's it's been a fun journey and uh, it's growing bigger than I think I ever thought it could. So so it's pretty 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 cool. So Natasha, what you're doing with Visibility STEM Africa is incredibly important and it's inspiring too, I think. And a question that I have is how do you take that momentum from Visibility STEM Africa and actually bring it to the next level? Are you thinking about putting together a symposium or a group of people who can further discuss some of these issues? Yeah, absolutely. So over the last uh, couple of months, we've had a lot of different ideas and it's been kind of difficult to choose which idea we, we want to run with because, um, of course, we have the limitation of time. But uh, I think we have two exciting things that are happening. Uh, the first one is we created a Slack community for Africans in STEM um, because, you know, on social media, we have people following us from everywhere. So it can be hard to actually be able to distinguish who is within the African STEM community. So we got that started and it's been super exciting to see everybody introducing themselves, all the different Africans and spread all over the world, telling us about their work and, you know, people getting to know each other. So that's been really fun. And we hope through the Slack community, we can start to find uh, subgroups of people who want to work together to create projects, um, to do different things. So that's ongoing. Um, and then the second thing, which we're super, super excited about is we're organizing our uh, Visibility STEM Africa inaugural conference. Um, so that will be held on the 12th and 13th of December. And um, the idea we had is, again, we've had a lot of traction. We've had a lot of um, people engaging with us, but we wanted to make it bigger. We wanted to really showcase what Visibility STEM Africa is about by actually creating this um, a bigger platform where people can give talks and we can showcase what um, really the values and ethos are of our, our organization. So um, so this conference will be STEM for us, by us. That's kind of the big theme. Um, we ha It's going to be on two different days, the 12th and the 13th of December. Uh, day one will be focusing on navigating your path in STEM. And then day two will be uh, the theme, the new African scientist, which is super exciting. We have a really, really cool lineup of, of speakers of some people who are more seasoned academics who are, you know, now professors and, and heading research institutes, but also young people like me, PhD students, master students who are really embodying this new African scientist thing. Um, people who are like me, who are doing a PhD, but also doing a lot of things on the side who want to change, um, you know, the want to just change the game in terms of how STEM will continue to go. And it's super exciting. So, yeah, we definitely want everybody to, to, to attend this conference and just uh, get to see uh, Africans tell their own stories, Africans in STEM specifically, and, and see all the work they're doing. Just get inspired. I think it can be inspiring for everyone, not only for Africans, but just for anyone who's interested in STEM, period, or just interested in hearing cool stories. So yeah, super, super exciting. Wow, it's bold to be starting anything in these dark times, but I mean, what better time, right? Uh, it's never... It's always dark before the dawn, and hopefully we have a, a really bright horizon in the future showcasing African scientists like yourself. And, you know, add it to the list, right? You're doing your graduate work in uh, Luxembourg, Center for Systems Biomedicine, and specifically the Developmental and Cellular Biology Group, which is led by Dr. Jeans Schwamborn. Sorry about that, doctor. Uh, I'm not sure if we've ever mentioned the tiny European country of Luxembourg here on the podcast, but I did my research and found that the University of Luxembourg, where you're located, is one of the fastest growing schools in the world and was only founded in 2003. And of course, with the prefix Lugs, we know it's no shantytown, right? It's got to be pretty fancy over there. But apart from those fancy digs, what about your training there is, is most important to setting you up? for your career track. I mean, I love to talk to young people in science like you because you've, you're you not bound by the traditional paradigm, right? You can do whatever you want and you will. I feel like it's, and when I was 
at your stage, I just thought I had to do, you know, it was too risky, but I feel like your generation is much, has much more courage along those lines. Um, so what's important there about setting up your career track and do you, do you see the track being traditional or do you think you're going to go off on a, on a more trailblazing path? I think it's going to be the latter. Please verify. Ooh, that's a great question. It's a tough one too. Um, I've had somewhat of the freedom to also explore other aspects of science outside of just, you know, being in the lab, doing research, although that is, and will always be like the, you know, my, my, my core business here, um, and I think we, it's, it's an excellent institute, you know, I think just considering the institute itself is only 10 years old, I think they've made a lot of strides and it's really developing fast. We're a pretty big group, so it's a lot of support. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy on the front of, you know, the research, but also I think in terms of being able to explore things like science communication, which I, I really enjoy that. Um, there's even efforts within the institute to have, um, there was the Science for Everyone initiative they started where we talk to people who are outside of the lab, like people in admin and things like that, to be able to, so they know what's actually going on in the Institute. Um, so I got to participate in things like that. Um, having even support for Visibility STEM Africa, because of course that's not always the case when you have a side thing. It's, you might not always have support from, um, you know, from your Institute because a lot of the times it's like, yeah, you need to focus just on on the on, on the science, but I think increasingly people are seeing the importance of these efforts because you know it's, um, if if we don't include everyone in science, I think the science will always suffer in, in some ways, right? So mm. I think they they see the value in that. And regarding um, my my path, I I I I probably will not necessarily follow the traditional I guess path. I think what is exciting about now is that science is changing. I think. A couple of years ago, science communication didn't even seem like maybe a viable career option. But now, you know, there's way more spaces and, and ways to to get involved in SciComm. Um, and I, I, I really love outreach work and science communication, but I love being in the lab. So I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, uh, you know, in three years time when I'm two and a half years time when I'm done with my PhD, if uh, it's going to be the postdoc and et cetera. But I, I think I'm always somehow going to be involved in in work that um, helps to open doors for people because it's something I'm passionate about and I think it's it's important. I think just because of my background, it's something that it, it, it's always going to be something I can't forget about, you know, because it really informed my own experience. So I, I want to make things better for the people coming off to me. So through my science, but also through advocacy work. So I think my path will definitely combine those two things. We will see what career I will create in a couple of years, so we can check in <laughs> and see what I've done. <laughs> yeah, we certainly will. We will uh, check in with you in a couple of years. Can't wait to see how that turns out. Your path is, you know, it's, it's illuminated with all your accolades. So uh, I think it'll be a, a clear journey for you towards success. Congratulations, and thank you so much uh, for taking the time to chat with us. Well, thanks a lot for having me. Super great to to meet both of you and to chat a bit about um, my work and Visibility STEM Africa and everything. So yeah, thank you so much. This is, this is really awesome to be on this platform. Really grateful. Our final guest is Sartak Sinha, an MD, PhD candidate and a veneer scholar in Dr. Jeff Bernanski's lab at the University of Calgary. His doctoral project utilizes single-cell genomics to understand mechanisms driving skin fibrosis and regeneration across different mammals. All right, Sartak, thanks a lot for joining us. It's my pleasure, Dalen and Erwin. Yes, yeah, Sartak, you're up there in uh, warm, sunny Canada, up there at the University of Calgary. You're doing an MD-PhD in Dr. Jeff Bernaski's lab. But interestingly enough, you have... a um, a bit of a, a long-term background in the lab. It says here you actually started in the lab way before grad school and actually started working there in the ninth grade. Let's talk about taking initiative, right? It also says a lot about your advisor, that he was willing to take yeah. you on as a high school student. A lot of PIs don't even take undergrads, let alone high school students, right? So before we dive into your research, talk a little bit about how you ended up making that happen. And since you've been there for so long, you probably like working there. So what's it like uh, about the University of Calgary and about the Bernaski Lab that has kind of kept you there for so long as a lab veteran? Yeah. Um, no, you know, so on my end, it really started with um, 
in in ninth grade was sort of when I when I came to appreciate that my aunt was struggling with a congenital heart defect and and at the time I'd been reading about you know stem cells and regenerative medicine and their potential to 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 rebuild or restore function um, and so that sort of prompted me to to write a proposal and sort of circulate it to to different faculty members at the university um, but but you know I think my you know, contribution to that sort of ends there. And, and it's really Jeff's initiative or, or his willingness to take on um, a young trainee like myself at the time starts there. Um, but, you know, you know, having known Jeff for, you know, nearly a decade now, that's that's something very characteristic of him. Um, he takes bets on on his trainees ideas and sort of gives us the ability to, you know, um, to, to not feel limited in, you know, what we propose at whatever level we propose. Um, and, and that, that, that sort of characteristic as a mentor has really sort of, um, kept me coming back and has kept, you know, was something that initially got me hooked into science. Um, but has, you know, helped me retain that ever since this, this ability that, you know, you can ask questions, feel like you've got this, um, this, the support, this unconditional support uh, from your supervisor to, to, you know, pursue whatever direction, take whatever direction. Um, and, and, and I know I'm not, I'm not the only one in the lab who feels that way. I think, I think this is a unanimous sort of feeling. Um, so, 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 so certainly, certainly I think an example, if we can highlight more of um, to take bets on younger trainees and, and give them the confidence to pursue their ideas boldly. Right. Yes. It's a, uh... It takes a lot of courage to take on a young trainee. I gotta, I gotta give it up to Jeff there. But I have to say, there's also the other side of that, right? And uh, the great thing about youth is that you're not, you know, brow beaten by all the things you've been told that are impossible and can't be done, or the failures you've had in the past. You're kind of just wide open, right? You have an idea, like why can't we? Why can't we? So you come with these really innovative ideas just by virtue of the fact that they're so naive, and sometimes. Sometimes, because you don't know all the things that stand in your way, you just push through. And uh, if your advisor and, and the technology can enable you, you can really have a breakthrough that people probably five years before were saying, yeah, well, that's impossible. And I think that's illustrated well by your, you know, your doctoral work. You're using the cutting edge technology, you're using single cell genomics to understand mechanisms driving skin fibrosis and regeneration across different mammals you know it's not just you know i think this is what we're talking about with the youth is that this unbridled imagination people are so focused on ourselves navel gazing you're going outside into the zoo that is greater biology you just had a big story actually in cell stem cell last month congratulations on that um and you know what i'm getting at is this increased focus on using the high tech to study evolutionary developmental biology this comparative evolutionary approach, whether it's Gene Loring and our IPSC farm, or we just had Mickey Abisuya on the show last week. He's talking about species-specific organoids to, to study segmentation and the clock there. So what's your angle on this whole comparative uh, platform? We know that different species have higher or lower capacity for skin regeneration in your focus there, but what do you hope to discover using all the high tech, the single cell, um, toward this comparative uh, approach and evolutionary approach in IPS cells. What's your goal there? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I've really come to appreciate, you know, through my doctoral program is, um, you know, like all, all the push on clinical translation and, you know, doing things that are very immediately translatable, um, and perhaps only studying the human system as, 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 as important as that is in, in guiding therapy and, you know, improving quality of life in a very immediate fashion, um, somewhere it's prohibitive in the sense that it doesn't captivate the full imagination of what is possible, um, you know, in the broader animal kingdom, right? Um, you know, even within mammals, for example, um, as, you, as you alluded to, there is, there is a wide propensity for 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 outcomes post injury, for example, um, you know the the classic we always talk about is the scar formation and regeneration, and different mammalian tissues, different mammals and different mammalian tissues vary and and you know are you know 
quite quite dramatically along that spectrum. So you know, so for for my doctoral project, um, one of the things I should recognize we're very fortunate to be situated within the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine here at the University of Calgary, mm -hmm. and one of the things that we have at our at our disposal is um, large animal expertise. So so we've got a captive herd of reindeers, which you know, which is very. <laughs> um, you know, uh, not typical of, you know, classic laboratories that, that, you know, typically focus on rodents or, or smaller model organisms. So, so, so the, so the scope is to, to compare regenerative and fibrotic programs in rodents, reindeers, and humans, and try to really understand, um, what, what are the core programs that are conserved? Um, what are capabilities that are lost? And perhaps try to identify whether a latent potential for regeneration exists. And, you know, the title of our cell stem cell paper, uh, trying to identify a latent program that can be tapped into um, to, to coax um, the principal cells, the, the keratinocytes or fibroblasts towards a more uh, regenerative fate. Um, so it's trying to, trying to seek inspiration from the animal kingdom and, and expanding our imagination of what's possible in biology, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exciting, man. If I ever visit Calgary, I'm gonna you have to show me that reindeer farm of yours, just so I can take one home for Christmas. How's that sound? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we love talking about the cutting edge tech here on the show. We're talking about single cell genomics here, and in addition to cutting edge tech, we're talking about cutting edge journals as well, and in particular, a unique journal, Jove, the Journal of Visual Experiments that you actually published in. You had an article titled "Droplet Barcoding Based Single Cell Transcriptomics." of adult mammalian tissues. It's a relatively new journal, this uh, this journal Jove, but it's a cool concept, right? It presents video articles and step-by-step -step videos of how to actually do a particular technique. And in my opinion, it kind of reflects the expansion of science communication into a different media stream. So tell us about your experience with Jove and how you see new media formats expanding on the way we consume and integrate scientific literature. That's that's the yeah, it's 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 a really important um, point, you know. Let's start with this podcast, for example. You know, I I wrote to you guys saying that you know I, I listen to you guys podcast every day, forty minute commute to work. Um, you know, when the episodes become available, and that historically has not been a format through which science has been disseminated. Right? We have largely focused on journal articles, texts. Um, and as, as important as that medium is and as long lived as, a, you know, that that longevity is a testament to how important that format is, um, you know, as scientists, we, some, you know, we somewhere just want to talk and somewhere, you know, if you can gather people in the same room and, you know, have ideas and discussions and endlessly, you know, um, teach each other and learn from each other, you know, that's, that's what science has always been. That's sort of the history of science. People trying to get together, you know, build on each other's ideas, show them how, to, how we do things in our lab and, you know, trying to learn from that. Um, and Jove to us was an extension of that, um, you know, this was this was at a time when uh, so single cell transcriptomics has now become fairly routine in in, in a number of laboratories. Um, but this was at a time where we were first dabbling with how do we prepare a good single cell suspension to barcode, or how do we how do we prepare single cell suspensions from a number of different mammalian tissue systems um, that that we can then profile. Um, and we realized, you know, we have learned a lot of lots of tips and tricks to optimize, you know, the final product that we saw. And there was a lot of, you know, I wouldn't say wasted dollars, but but dollars spent in learning um, that if we can save our fellow scientists, you know, we, we're happy to sort of go through that process and and make a video article, you know, walking people step by step um, and how to do that. And, and hopefully it's it's helped the community in, 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 in having, you know, um, less, less optimization things to worry about and, um, and, and be able to sort of perform this technique more routinely. Yes. High tech saving us all the trouble. And, uh, yeah, these new media streams are, are, it's a, it's a new world in science and, uh, it's your generation that's leading the charge and your, your science fluency and accomplishment belies your tender age. I mean, you're a young man. I'm looking at your resume here. Canada's top 20 under 20, Alberta's top 30 under 30, Calgary's top 40 under 40. I don't know what you were doing from the age of zero to 10, but clearly you were slouching because you didn't make the top 10 under 10 list. 
Myself, I'm shooting for top 100 under 100, but I don't know. That's going to be a stretch. I want to ask you, though, seriously, on when it comes to these feathers in your cap, um, it's clearly, I, I wonder, is it chicken or egg? You have all these you know, major highlights of your career very early on. Um, do they feed forward and, and, and give you more opportunities? Or do you think the same thing that gives you all the opportunities is your baseline, essentially, and your effort and your ambition, that's what leads to those awards as well as the opportunities? Or do they synergize? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a very very interesting question because I've I've reflected a lot on the sort of societal structure in which you know science doesn't operate in isolation of that. So, you know, the societal structure seems to be, um, you know, so, so somewhat hierarchical in the sense that you know a lot of resources are fed to people who are doing a lot of good stuff, right? Um, and you know, there's a reason why you know, in any domain of science, you have a few prominent investigators who keep getting, you know, all the big NIH awards and big CIHR awards. Um, and, and, you know, there seems to be a saturation. Somewhere, you know, like early on, I, I was very drawn to that. Somewhere, you know, I wanted to, you know, have all the opportunities and, and you know, these these awards certainly afforded more and more of that. But over time, I've, I've, I've appreciated that, you know, we have to democratize more and more because as you were saying, you know, when, when I've had summer students, for example, and they've come in and have imparted such unique insights, for example, they've been far more proficient in computation, for example, than I have, or, or you know, have brought in ideas that, you know, like my now jaded tenure, you know, self of looking at one system, one tissue, you know, wasn't thinking of or wasn't as receptive to. And you know, over time, I've, I've, I've tried to now, you know, sort of use these platforms to try to democratize, um, you know, access to, to opportunities. Because I think that's, that's what this, this, this gets you, right? Um, so so I've, I've certainly, you know, been very fortunate to, to, to have received some of that. I know in my early years, um, you know, like that, that was a very intentional goal because, you know, that seemed like, you know, that's what would buy access to, to opportunities. But I think, I think, you know, more and more, um, I've come to realize, you know, that we need to democratize this for, you know, for my own growth, but also for the growth of science and, you know, for, for, for our collective, um, growth. So, so it's an interesting question and, you know, um, and one that I kind of think, think and reflect a lot about. Well, I'm just happy to be talking to two tops. I know Arun was top something under something in his own career. Like I said, I'm still trying to get the top. So, you know, it doesn't make your experiments go any better. Um, but I think it does reflect the the effort and uh, your dedication. I have to say congratulations on knowing what you've wanted to do from such a young age. I'm jealous uh, that you, you're going to have so much time in your life to dedicate to this thing you love. So enjoy, my man, and, and thanks for joining us. No, thank you. This, is, this has been a pleasure. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of this show. What a great episode talking to these trainees. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. You know, that feedback led to uh, these trainees being on the show, you know. So if you want to get in there, tell us about something you're working on, you might find your way on the show too. This was a great episode talking to the future of stem cell science, and I can't wait to have one or all of these guests back on the show when they're presenting their next first author research or even running their own lab. Very exciting times ahead, guys. Join us in the next couple weeks for another episode. Thanks for listening.